morning. We just decided to take over Joyner Park. How's that? Welcome, welcome. We are so glad you're here. All the church as well as family and friends. Welcome to this gathering of the church in the park. That was, uh, that was the name of this event that was voted upon. Uh, there were others suggested, such as Church on Grass. But we thought that might give the wrong connotation. And we might have a totally kind of different party here. So we are glad that you are here and we get to celebrate today the greatest news mankind has ever received. And today we're going to do that in a very vivid fashion. Not just singing the gospel, not just hearing the gospel, but visibly even seeing what the truth of Jesus Christ does to a person in the uh, death, burial, and resurrection that is represented in baptism today. We have several people that are going to be following Christ in baptism. So it's going to be a great day. We're going to share a meal together. Um, I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. I hope you have too. And you guys look beautiful, by the way. It is really cool. This is, this is one of the most exciting aspects of what we're doing today, is that we are a church in two services. Uh, virtually all the time. And here we are it, together as one. And so uh, just for a moment, because you may see somebody across the way and you're like, I had no idea you were, went to this church. I just want to take a moment. We're going to stand up. I want to invite you to mingle. Uh, say hello to your neighbor. Introduce guests. You may have family, friends. Let's stand up and let's uh, welcome everybody to our uh, gathering today.
redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. In Christ we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, while you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were revealed, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches that he has 
given you his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all.
in Christ Jesus that the songs that we sing contain truth that changes hearts and lives. And we sing them uh, with more confidence and with more joy than any other song we have to sing. And so God, be with us now as we rejoice in you, as we give thanks to you for all you've done for us in Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, North Wake, the full corporate body of North Wake. It is so good to see everybody here together. My name is Mark Savage. I'm one of the elders here. I've been coming here a long time. But today I was just overwhelmed sitting here about the kindness of God to our church and to our community. And as I was sitting there, I couldn't help notice Gene Woodall over here uh, consistently checking and monitoring the, uh, the temperature of the baptismal. And, and that choked me up a little bit because I think that that's what that church has always been. People working to serve, to serve the body in all sorts of ways. So I want to also give thanks for all the people who showed up so early today, who planned to do all this so we could be together. If you're joining us today, if you're not a member of North Wake, and we hope maybe you were just walking by and were caught up by that harmonica solo and decided to join us. I was caught up by that harmonica solo. I would have chosen to join us. Um, but if you're here today, we want to thank you for just... Uh, uh, sitting and listening to the message, looking at and observing the truth of baptismal as a great metaphor uh, for the story of Jesus Christ and Him risen. Um, in a moment, we're going to take offering. We want you not to give to our offering if you are visiting. We hope that you'll stay and have a meal with us and enjoy in fellowship with us. We also like to take this time, uh, I'd like to direct you to your program. I'd also like to remind you to direct you to your program at the end of this so that we make sure that we leave this park beautifully. Um, but today we're gonna pray for uh, the Hollins and the Conleys who are in Martinsville, Virginia. If you don't know their story, that's where Rob Conley grew up and where he felt a mission to go and serve. And their service is going really well. We're thankful that when you go to plant a church, you still have a network of help. George Robinson, who's over here to my right, has been really working with them about making disciples in Martinsville. And you can see that they're going through all the things a church goes through, uh, great joy and great sorrow, and what to do with the kids, and how to invite the kids in and push them into disciple makers. So we'd like to pray for them today for the offering and for Pastor Larry's message. So if you join me in prayer. Father, your kindness to us is overwhelming. There's so many examples of it here. We pray that for our church, that kindness uh, would overflow in our uh, joy to share you with everybody, with our workers, with the nations, with the world. And we're thankful for the Conleys and the Hollands who left uh, this very comfortable, this very joyful community to, to charge out and carve one out of Martinsville, Virginia, a place that in many ways, as Robert pointed, had, had missed it. And so we are thankful that their story is going on. We're thankful for Uptown Kids and we grieve with them as they lose key members of their church. And so we pray that you would keep the unity of these two families, that you would draw many to them and uh, that we would continue to hear great things from Martinsville. We pray for our leaders today. We pray for Larry's message, that it would penetrate our hearts, even if it's familiar, that we would see it and hear it in new ways. And Father, we are thankful for baptism. We're thankful that you gave us uh, this sign of obedience and how we love to hear the stories of how uh, the men and women and, and teens and whomever have come to this point. We thank you for this weather, Lord, that we would be comfortable and could hear from you. In Jesus' name. In the 1980s, how many of you remember the 1980s? That's a good sign. How many of you do not remember the 1980s? How many of you were not born yet? That's a good sign. All right. That's a good sign because we're, you're about to get educated, those of you who missed the 1980s, on uh, some great, great music that was produced in the 1980s. Um, group by the name of U2, who most of you probably know, uh, wrote, an al had, wrote a song that was part of an album called Joshua Tree. It was, the t it was the opening track of the album. It was called Where the Streets Have No Name. And uh, Bono wrote the song 
um, after he had uh, thought about how uh, socio um, equity was not a part at all of the streets of Dublin and how you could you could know the social status of a person based off the name of the street that they lived in and um, he went to Africa later and found the exact same thing happening in Africa and it burdened him such that he wanted to write this song about this this time in this place where uh, someone would not be known by what street they lived on because the streets uh, in this place would have no name. Everyone would, uh, everyone would be on equal footing, equal ground. And uh, as he wrote this song, uh, the verses and even the chorus uh, shed light in a very ambiguous way as to where this place is. It's a place that uh, the writer of the song can never go to by himself. He keeps, the, the verses speak of a frustration that he has with wanting to break out of where he is and be able to go to this place where the streets have no name. But he keeps trying to build up love and it just tears back down again. He builds it up and he tears it back down again. And then the end of the course he says, but when I go there, I go there with you. It's all I can do. And uh, I believe what he's communicating there is that when, when that place that he's speaking of is heaven. Heaven is the place where there is no names on any streets. Dr. Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, all of those men are on equal footing before the throne of God above. Uh, there is no social diversity. It is all equal there. Um, but in order to go there, in order for that sort of social equity to be that peace, to be realized, it's something that we cannot do by ourselves. It's, some, it's a place that we have to be taken. Someone has to come and rescue us from here in order to get us there. And uh, so I, I hope if for many of you who uh, were born in the 80s and know this, I hope that uh, you hear this with new ears, maybe with new eyes uh, on the song. And by all means, uh, as, as we are, um, as we very much encourage to do, George Robinson is smiling at me. Sing, George. I know you're going to want to, so please sing along. <laughs>
Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Y'all awake out there? Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Good morning. Glad that you could worship with us. We believe that our God, our Redeemer God, the Maker God, is worthy of our trust and our worship and our love. And so this summer, while I was uh, out of my usual role at the church, I was on sabbatical, uh, there's a little practice that I undertook, but I'm still doing to this day, I want to commend it to you, that was extremely helpful for me, and continues to be. I, uh, each day, would open up one of the Gospels of Jesus, his biographies in the New Testament, and I would read one chapter, and I would look there for one thing about Christ that made me delight in Him more, made me want to love and follow and trust Him more. And so uh, what I found was that every day, without fail, I would find something in every single chapter that was absolutely amazing about Christ, about Jesus. You know, one day He would give sight to the blind, and the next day He would heal the lame, and then He would teach using these amazingly simple but amazingly wise little stories. He would confound his enemies. He would lovingly teach his disciples. He would, he would cast out demons. He would miraculously feed thousands. He would walk on the water. He would turn water into wine. He would raise a widow's son from the dead. And then another day he would raise a little girl from the dead. And then he himself would rise from the dead every day without fail. I think, I think you get the idea. I hope you'll try it. But today what I want to do is share with you three of those stories um, that I found so encouraging as I try to follow and love Christ more. Um, the first one of those is found in Mark chapter 10. Um, you'll need to open up your Bibles today. We thought about skywriting. It was a little expensive. So you're going to have to open your Bibles to follow along this morning. Uh, but I'd like to pray for us as we, as we turn there for the first of these three stories. Bow with me, please. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We follow you. And so I pray today by these stories that show us who you are. We might trust you and love you more and more. And this we ask in Christ, your great name. Amen. Well, these stories that I'm going to tell you, I just want to make sure you're clear about this. They present themselves as history, as true stories, not historical fiction. That's a later genre. Uh, true stories about who Jesus really is and what he did. And the first of those involves a man. His name is Bartimaeus, and his story is found in Mark chapter 10, at the back end of that chapter, starting in verse 46. And it reads like this. And they came to Jericho, that is, Jesus and his entourage. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. Well, that worked really well. Time out. Let's try this. That's better. Timaeus, this a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up. He is calling you. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. The story of Bartimaeus, the blind man. And this is one of the marks of Jesus' ministry. It happens on a number of occasions. He made the blind to see. Now in this particular instance, Jesus and a large crowd were, were traveling. 
Um, they were just about to enter the city of Jerusalem for the very last time. We call that entrance the triumphal entry. It happened on Palm Sunday, the week in which Jesus went to the cross. Just prior to that, um, they were about to enter the city, and the crowd is huge as a result of the timing. Uh, a great crowd, the account says, and it's here that we meet Bartimaeus. And it's interesting, Bartimaeus' story is told by three of the four biographers of Jesus. Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke all tell his story. And in Matthew's telling, we find out that Bartimaeus actually was had another friend with him, another blind beggar who was with him. But Mark focuses on Bartimaeus, and only Mark tells us what his name is. Bartimaeus means the son of a man named Timaeus. We would say Bart, son of Tim. That's what we would probably call him. And of course, uh, we find him sitting by the road begging. Well, what else could a first century blind beggar do? He can't see the crowd, but you know that he can feel the rumble of many footsteps. He can taste the cloud of dust. He can hear the many voices. And amidst it all, he hears the voices say, it's Jesus of Nazareth. It's Jesus of Nazareth who is about to pass by. And so Bart cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Again and again we get the sense he cries out this, this repeated frame, have mercy on me. But many, it says, rebuke him. They, the crowd shushes him. And he cries out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Really, the mind-boggling thing is what happens next. Uh, Jesus, in the midst of all of that crowd, stops and gives him his attention. And he calls this one blind beggar to him so that those who had just shushed our friend Bart now say, take heart, cheer up. He is calling you. And our story ends this way. It's the happiest possible ending, right? Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now, this is a rich story. I just want to draw two points, two takeaways for us from this story. The first one is this. Bartimaeus teaches us something about how to pray. Because that's really what his cry to, for mercy is. It's the simplest of prayers. And it just goes like this. Jesus, have mercy on me. It is a wonderful way to pray. And he perseveres in it. The crowd cannot silence him. Even though they shush him repeatedly. He will not stop praying and asking Jesus for mercy. And Jesus says it's an expression of his faith. And it's, it's fascinating. Jesus calls Bartimaeus to him and he says, uh, what do you want me to do for you? Now, isn't it kind of obvious what he would like Jesus to do for him? Maybe not so much because he's not just blind. He's also a beggar and a beggar maybe all the mercy he wants from Jesus is some coin and so Jesus asks to see and he doesn't ask for money which you would expect a beggar to do he asks a greater miracle he asks to see he prays in faith he asks a great mercy of Jesus over and over again he perseveres in it Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. It's a fantastic prayer. It's all throughout the Bible, often in the presence of Jesus. A Canaanite mom whose daughter is suffering terribly prays that prayer on behalf of her daughter. A dad who waits for Jesus in desperation at the foot of that Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus was with his disciples 
When Jesus comes down, He prays it for His suffering Son. There's another set of blind men elsewhere in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. They pray this prayer as well. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus answers them all. He grants every one of them mercy. Bartimaeus teaches us something about how we should pray. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Now, there's a second takeaway from this story that I want to underscore for you today. And that is this simple prayer for mercy is a prayer that Jesus loves to answer. Jesus is eager to hear a cry for mercy from those who suffer, from those who are disenfranchised, from those who have nowhere else to turn. Jesus, have mercy on me is a prayer he loves to answer. And it's a beautiful prayer for us to pray because it, it restores order to our personal universe, right? This little prayer exalts Jesus as mighty and merciful. He is able and willing to help. And we are humbled as needy before Him. It, it puts our personal universe in order. Psalm 50 writes about it this way in verse 15. God says, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. It's the way things are supposed to be. God is great, and we are not. And so, our story ends with that simple statement of Jesus, go your way, your faith has made you well, and immediately he recovers his sight and followed him on the way. Immediately. What does Bart do once he receives mercy? He follows Jesus. What else could a formerly blind beggar do? but follow the one who showed him God's mercy. So, from Bartimaeus, we learn how we should pray. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. It's the simplest of prayers. You can pray it wherever you go. You can pray it in a meeting. You can pray it at school. You can pray it on your way to work. You can always pray because we always need his mercy. And we learn from Jesus how to have hope when we pray. He is most merciful to us when we are in our greatest need. He loves to answer a simple prayer for mercy. Let's look at a second story together. This one you'll find in your Bibles in Luke chapter 17. I call this story the story of the nine ingrates. Um, it's known in the Bible as the story of the ten lepers. And it starts in verse 11 of Luke chapter 17, and it reads this way. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went... They were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. So once again, this story takes place as Jesus is on his way on that last journey to Jerusalem. And this time he encounters lepers, people with some kind of terrible skin disease. And there's a small herd of them, right? There's 10 of them. And they cry out to Jesus, it says, from a distance. And they do it from a distance because their ailment may have been contagious. And they were, as a result, considered unclean under the Jewish laws. The laws from the Old Testament book of Leviticus describe this sorrowful experience that they lived this way. It says in chapter 13 of Leviticus, 
the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out unclean unclean and he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease he is unclean he shall live alone his dwelling shall be outside the camp so lepers were the outcasts of the worst sort they had to live alone apart from everyone else and if anyone approached them they covered their mouth and they cried out unclean unclean here Jesus encounters ten of them who have banded together and did you notice what they cry out they don't cry out unclean unclean they cry out just like Bartimaeus Jesus master have mercy on us and so Jesus sends them to the priest he was the one person who could declare them clean who could verify their healing and it says as they went they were cleansed they were healed can you imagine what that would have been like they're walking down the road to see the priest and they begin to feel life and health flowing through their limbs flowing through their veins and they look at each other and they look <coughs> different and a celebration breaks out and I imagine some of them bypassed the priest and went straight to their families maybe for the first time in years maybe in decades they could enter their own home they could hug their children and kiss their spouses but if they went to the priest I imagine they ran to that priest all the lepers did except for one one ran the other way it says in verse 15 it says one of them when he saw that he was healed turned back praising God with a loud voice and he fell on his face at Jesus feet giving him thanks now this one he was a Samaritan Samaritans uh, Jews had really had no use for them uh, they were considered religious heretics on the one hand and racial half-breeds on the other and so it was an exclusive an excluding mix of theological superiority and racism and yet this Samaritan was the only one who returned to Jesus to give thanks and the story makes this subtle point so much for racial exclusivity and superiority in Jesus kingdom not in Jesus kingdom and it seems the other nine probably had more important things to do more important places to be than to return to the one who gave them their lives back and to give him thanks and that's why I call this story the story of the nine ingrates right they were given their lives back literally and they don't return to thank Jesus for it maybe they were too busy returning home or being reunited with family and friends, really good and important things. But whatever they were doing, they failed to return and thank the one who gave them their lives back. Think of that, nine out of 10, 90% were ungrateful. Makes you wonder, do you think those percentages hold true today? Could 90% of us be ingrates? Nah, not us, right? And if they are, we're in the 10%, right? That's what you all are thinking? Let me ask you a question. You ever give thanks for one of these? Anybody see what this is? Mr. Savage, can you see what this is? Come here. 
Yeah, you. The important Mr. Savage. Come on down here. Everybody's far away this morning. I just need you to answer one question. What am I holding in my hand? A penny. Outstanding. 100%. A plus. Great job. Do you ever thank God for one of these? There's one guy who did. He thanked God more than half a million times for one of these. His name is Otha Anders. He's from Ruston, Louisiana, where my wife went to college. He spent 45 years bending down and collecting something that most of us would ignore, pennies. And in October of 2015, the 73-year-old in-school suspension supervisor, right, took these pennies in 15 five-gallon jugs to his bank. It took the coin machines five hours to count them. And the grand total was $5,136.14 worth of pennies. It's, do the math, that's, that's a lot of pennies. That's over a half a million pennies. But what's most intriguing about Mr. Andrew's story is not his thriftiness. It's his thankfulness. Because every new penny on the ground served as a prompt for him to give thanks to God. <laughs> Listen to what he told the reporters. He says, uh, I became convinced that spotting a lost or dropped penny was an additional God-given incentive reminding me to always be thankful. He says, there have been many days where I've failed to pray and give thanks, and more often than not, a lost or dropped penny would show up to remind me. Let me quote that great theologian Denzel Washington. <laughs> He says, Denzel says, he says it well, give thanks for blessings every day. Embrace gratitude. Encourage others. It is impossible, he says, to be grateful and hateful at the same time. He says, I pray that you put your slippers way under your bed at night so that when you wake in the morning, you have to start on your knees to find them. <laughs> and while you're down there, he says, say thank you. Where are the other nine? Jesus wondered. I wonder, would he wonder that about you or about me? Would he wonder why we haven't returned this day to give thanks? Does thankfulness penetrate your day? Have you thanked God yet today? Maybe for this place or these people for his son whom we worship. Maybe even for your pastor. If you're desperate. Let's take 10 seconds. And let me ask you to just quietly give thanks to God for whatever he brings to your mind. I'll watch the time. Where are the other nine? Jesus wondered. See, the thing is, Jesus knew where they were. Jesus knew who they were. Before he healed them, he knew they were ingrates. They would not return and give thanks. And this is the beautiful thing about Jesus. Jesus knowingly heals. He knowingly lavishes mercy even on the ungrateful. Like these nine. Or like these nine hundred. Now that's something to be thankful for. That Jesus gives mercy to the undeserving. So great is his love. Even for folks like us. The Apostle Paul says God shows his love for us. In that while we were still sinners. Ungrateful. Christ died for us. One last story. 
This one comes from Matthew chapter 27. You can turn in your Bibles there. Um, and I hope that this story will help you love and trust Jesus more and more, just like the others. And it's the story of a man named Barabbas. And Barabbas' story is mentioned in all four of the Gospels, in one way or another. And Jesus is now just hours from the cross. He has been arrested and he is standing trial before Pilate when in verse 15 of Matthew 27, this is what we read. Now at the feast, the governor, Pilate, was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas? or Jesus, who is called Christ. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. And besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy, destroy Jesus. And the governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. <coughs> the Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. And so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. <coughs> All of the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. And then he released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. It's, it's remarkable, as you read it, how intertwined Jesus' story and Barabbas' story are. Now, in the interest of time this morning, a story this rich, I just want you to think with me about two things in this story, even though it's freighted with many, many more. First, there is a sense in which Barabbas is the first beneficiary of the substitutionary death of Jesus. Think about it. Because Jesus dies, Barabbas goes free. It's a paradigm, really, for Jesus' entire ministry. This was his purpose. This is why he intentionally came to Jerusalem and embraced the cross and did not flee it. You pick it up in the Garden of Gethsemane that night before when he was arrested initially. Soldiers come in under Judas' leadership on that night in that garden, and Jesus asked the soldiers again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you, I am He. And then He says, So if you seek Me, let these men go. Jesus put it another way, in John 15, he said, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. See, what happened in the garden with his friends, what happened with Barabbas, these are pointers to what Jesus would do on the cross for everyone who would entrust themselves to him. Jesus himself said, Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We sang about it earlier. The lyrics to Before the Throne of God Above, it says, Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. It's interesting. Um, some historians have suggested that because of that quickness with which Jesus was tried and moved to the cross, that there likely were already three crosses prepared for that crucifixion on that day. Two of them for the thieves who were crucified 
with Jesus. But the third cross may well have been for Barabbas. See, he was um, a murderer and a rebel, and he was sentenced and guilty. And Jesus, quite literally, took his place on that cross. And in a similar sense, quite literally, Jesus took our place on that cross, just like he did for Barabbas. He bore our sins penalty there. There's a sense in which Barabbas is the very first beneficiary of the death of Jesus, the substitutionary in his place death of Jesus. One more insight from this story and, and then we'll be done. The crowd on that day, a large crowd like maybe this crowd, faced a choice about what they were going to do with Jesus. Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? And listen to how I read it. Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called Christ. See, the names that are used here um, underscore their choice even more vividly, perhaps. Some of your Bibles call Barabbas that, Jesus Barabbas. And so, in a sense, you have the crowd urged by Pilate to choose their Jesus. Jesus Barabbas? Jesus, the son of Abbas? Or Jesus, who is called Christ? It's also interesting that the name Barabbas likely actually means son of the father. And on the very next page of your Bibles, while Jesus is hanging in agony on the cross, he is mocked for claiming to be God's son. That is, being the son of the father who is in heaven. And so they must choose between two men, both named Jesus, both called in some sense the son of the father. Now, Jesus Barabbas was, according to the Bible, as you read the different accounts, it's in all the Gospels. He was a robber and a murderer and quite possibly a rebel and an insurrectionist against the Roman occupation. And as such, he would strive to gain political freedom by the taking of life. But Jesus, who is called the Christ, would gain freedom for us from the tyranny, not of Rome, but of sin, by laying down his life four hours on the cross. And so they were faced with the decision that we face. Which Jesus will you choose? Jesus who is called Christ or some other hope, some other great leader, political or otherwise, some other ideology. And it's not just some ancient decision that was pressed on a crowd long ago. We all must decide. This crowd must decide. Will we trust Jesus, who is called the Christ? And people, people are still making that choice today to trust this Jesus, who is the Christ, and to follow him. And so today, as we close our service, you have a chance to hear from eight people who have, who have decided to follow Jesus. Jesus Christ and to trust Him and they're expressing that faith in baptism today. Some are younger, some are a bit older, but all have chosen to follow Jesus and baptism for them is a public act of worship and obedience to Jesus whom they trust and follow. It is in another sense an enactment of their faith. When we put them under the water of baptism, it represents that they believe in Jesus' death and burial for their behalf. And when we bring them up out of the water, it indicates that, that they believe in Jesus' resurrection on the third day to newness of life eternal. And I told the candidates when we were preparing them this morning, this is another reason we're really glad that Jesus rose from the dead, right? 
We don't just put them under the water and leave them there. We bring them up out of the waters of baptism. So in just a minute, I'm going to introduce them to you. Candidates, you're welcome to come up at this point in time. Um, but you have a threefold task while these candidates are coming to be baptized. First of all, you're going to get to hear real briefly from each of the candidates. Um, as they speak, would you be praying for them? Job one, pray for them. Job two, when they finished sharing, would you riotously applaud for them and the good work that God is doing in their life? You know, whistles, hoops, hollers. Mark Lederbach would be leading in the hoops and hollers. Uh, are perfectly appropriate and even expected to. Third thing, as you watch their example, would you consider whether you should trust and follow Jesus as well? Let me, uh, let me introduce him to you. 